Hello everyone. Today let's take a look at the most important topic of ore geology that is the ore forming processes. I cannot stress more on the importance of this topic since this basically describes the processes that leads to the genesis of an ore deposit. Understanding genesis of the known ore deposit is an essential skill to hunt for similar ore deposits in an unknown terrain. In this lecture let's learn how ore deposits are formed. What you see on the screen here is a series of pictures depicting the process that leads to the production of honey. The process begins with identifying the source of honey that is the flower. Then we need a mobilizing agent that is uh, honey bee. Then a path along which the mobilizing agent gets mobilized that is the free open space where bees can fly and finally we need an environment for deposition that is the beehive. The beehive is the place where the production of honey naturally takes place. There is too much similarity between the process of formation of honey and the process of formation of ore deposits. In the formation of ore deposits too, a source is required from where the required elements or metals are scavenged, transported, concentrated and accumulated to form ore deposits. The formation of ore deposit is mainly controlled by the factors such as availability of metals, fluids that is the carrier and ligands. Don't worry if you don't know what a ligand is, I will let you know in a couple of minutes. Availability of channels, pathways or the mobility of the fluids that carries metals, driving force behind the mobility of the fluids and lastly changes in pressure, temperature and chemically active fluids condition. When all these factors are favorable in a locality, an explorer is sure to get a mineral deposit. Success in locating a deposit depends on how one connects the dots during each and every stage of exploration. Understanding the ore forming process is primary component of such an ore mineral exploration drill. Or exercise. The sources of metals are mainly rocks of crustal or mantle origin. Metals such as magnesium, chromium, nickel, cobalt and platinum group of elements that is PGEs are sourced from mantle. Metals such as iron, copper, manganese and zinc are sourced from oceanic crust. Aluminum, zircon, rare earth elements and thorium are sourced from lower continental crust. Whereas tin, tungsten, molybdenum, lithium, rubidium, beryl, bismuth, tantalum, niobium, lead and uranium are sourced from upper continental crust. Generally, the metals from these sources are mobilized by fluids. Leaching by aqueous fluids such as magmatic, metamorphic, meteoric, basinal, brine and seawater in the presence of ligands is a common process. Similarly, partial melting of source rocks too mobilize the metals by magma. Generally, metals doesn't easily dissolve in aqueous fluids unless the fluids are enriched in certain chemical species known as ligands. Ligands are electron donors or electronegative ions with lone pairs of valence electrons. This significantly affect the solubility of metals in solution. The ligand combines with a metallic ion by the formation of a coordinate bond. For those of you who have no clue what a coordinate bond is. It is a type of covalent bond in which the shared electron pair is provided by only one of the participating molecules. In our case, that participating molecule is our ligand. However, in a normal covalent bonding, the shared electrons comes from each of the two participating components. That's the difference. Also to be noted here is a ligand that promotes the formation of complexes by coordination bonding 
will typically increase the solubility of metals in aqueous ore forming solutions. There's a general principle too for the ligand complexing. It's commonly referred to as Pearson's principle and states that hard metals such as acids and electron acceptors will always tend to complex with hard ligands such as bases or electron donors whereas soft metals complex with soft ligands. A borderline category indicates the metals that can complex readily with both hard and soft ligands forming a range of minerals such as sulfides and carbonates. Similarly, chloride can be an effective complexing agent for both hard and soft metals and therefore promotes the solubility of wide range of metals in hydrothermal solutions. So how do you know which of the complexing species or ligands were available for transporting metals? That is very crucial to understand. There are two known ways of determining that. The first one is to study the fluid inclusions which are regarded as the true samples of ore fluids. Fluid inclusions are the fluids trapped within the minerals during crystallization. The second one is the evidence from alteration minerals in the wall rock around the mineralized zone. For instance, if the fluid rich in tungstic acid interacts with the potassium wall rock containing predominantly K feldspar, then the feldspars will be converted to muscovite while tungsten gets precipitated. There can be several pathways inside the crust and mantle through which the fluids migrate before the mineral precipitation takes place. Some of them are fractures, breccia and porosity. The driving force responsible for the migration or mobility of the fluids are convective circulation of fluid around a heat source, for example like you have submarine volcanism that gives rise to VMS deposits or felsic magmatic intrusion that gives rise to porphyry copper deposits. Similarly, we have gravity driven fluid flow and fluid flow influenced by a geothermal gradient. These are the forces that drives the fluids from the source of origin to the source to the sink. Trapping the ore in a particular locality, that is the sink, requires drastic change in PTX, pressure, temperature and chemically active fluids. For instance, decompression lowers the ability of the ligands to hold on to the metal species in the fluids and hence promotes precipitation. Similarly, when the high temperature metal bearing fluids comes in contact with much cooler seawater, through the submarine volcanic vents, there definitely is a change in temperature that too promotes metal precipitation. Further, when the metal bearing fluid which is generally acidic in nature comes in contact with the rock that is more alkaline, it results in metal precipitation due to change in the chemical environment. Most of the times, Please do remember, combination of factors like variations in pressure temperature or temperature and chemically active fluids or pressure and chemically active fluids or pressure temperature and chemically active fluids, all three combined will be responsible for metal precipitation. So one must be very careful while assessing the probable reasons for the occurrence of metallic minerals in a particular locality. This will bear significant impact on his or her exploration results. Well, these are some of the key points one must remember before beginning the mineral exploration. If you can ensure that you make a thorough effort to understand the genetic aspect of a particular ore deposit with respect to its terrain, then you are halfway through your exploration program. It makes your job easier by helping you to choose the appropriate exploration methods to locate the deposit in an unknown terrain. Well, that's it for this class. Hope you all enjoyed this video. If you liked it, do give a thumbs up below and for more similar videos, hit the subscribe button. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.